I was up in New York doing a training at Gutman Community College last April, and I was fortunate enough that they had Cesar speaking to a group of students at Gutman. So when my training was over, I was able to go downstairs and listen to him. And I thought Cesar had a really powerful, compelling story that I really wanted to bring to Lone Star so our students could hear this story um, and hear Cesar's personal experiences. Uh, he's an attorney, he's the first undocumented person to become an attorney in the state of New York. Um, he graduated from the CUNY Law School. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cesar and have him speak to you guys for a little while, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me and welcoming me to your campus. Uh, one of the reasons that um, traveling and speaking with communities and college campuses is to really focus on a very different type of conversation when it comes to immigration reform. We hear that word plenty in the media. We hear the conversation of immigration reform with our friends, with our families, coworkers, the debate perhaps in college. But let's focus on what that word means. It focuses more on the policy, on the politics. More than ever with the election, we have that debate even much more pronounced. So this is not about an immigration reform argument pro or against. This is not about one candidate over another. Did you support Hillary Clinton? Great. Did you support Bernie Sanders? Great. Did you support Donald Trump? Great. This is, that is our voice as a people for us to demonstrate what direction we want to take this country. But immigration has something much more elemental than the policy, than the politics. It is about the stories. And to understand really those words, let's go to the very, very foundation of what is not just immigration reform, but the people. Let's define what an immigrant is. So, according to Webster's Dictionary, an immigrant is defined as a person who migrates to another country, usually for permanent residence. Sounds familiar, sounds closer to what we hear in the, on television, and very close to what it means uh, in the legal term. But let's go down even deeper. Let's dig in into the root to truly understand that word. And, even, and in fact, Webster Dictionary goes even further than that. It defines it as an, an organism found in a new habitat. Now, an organism can be a cell. An organism can be a plant. An organism can be an animal. An organism can be a college student. Now, the second part, a new habitat. A new habitat can be an organ for a cell. It can be a rainforest for an animal. It can be Lone Star College for a student. So I'm going to ask a question to you all, and the way you're going to respond is by standing up. So those who are not from Houston, Texas originally, please stand up. All right, look around. More than half of the room. You can sit down. So see, when we're talking about an immigrant, it's not just the political debate. It's the very instinctive nature for people to move from one place to another for a better opportunity, for a college education, to follow the person you fell in love with. And we bring it back because 
An immigrant is a human found in a new habitat. And this is what this conversation is about. It's not a political debate. My mom has a, an amazing analogy for society. She says, look at your hand. Different size fingers. We're all different. Are we going to have differences in opinion? Absolutely. Do we have different outlooks on life? Yes, we do. But we all have those stories that are filled with experiences. And we're going to debate the politics in the next four years on immigration. But we cannot debate our very experiences to, to explain why we are in a specific time and place. And for me, that is exactly what I come here to, to sp speak and to connect with you all. To tell you that for me, it starts really with the dream and aspiration of my mother. And for me, it starts like in first grade when I was actually in my classroom in Mexico. And all I remember at that time is just the clanking of the chalk, the heavy smell of Elmer's glue. I don't know why I have that, that smell still there. Either I was playing with glue or I was sniffing glue at five, six years old. So I don't know on that. <laughs> we all did, right? But, you know, I, I remember my, my teacher, as I was playing there, coming up, over to me and tapping me in my, in my uh, shoulders and saying, uh, Caesar, your mom's here to pick you up. And for me, I didn't think about at that time because, you know, for me at five years old, great, I'm going home. Forget school. But instead of going home, my mother went to pick up my little brother, my older sister, my two older sisters who were about nine and 11. And instead of going home, we went to the La Catedral de Puebla, a big, beautiful church in the town square in the town where I was from. And she, we walked inside and she took us all the way to the altar, knelt down, and I remember her whispering, Diosito, cuidanos. God, watch over us. And I have a picture of the last day we were in Mexico. I was little, kneeling down. My brother was to my right. My two older sisters were right to my right, and my mother towering over us in a blue dress. And a crumbled up brown plastic bag. In that plastic bag, she had cash, our birth certificates, our school records. In essence, in that plastic bag was our ticket to a new life. No carry-ons, no luggage, no hair products, just that plastic bag for us to start a new life in a new world. And you know, for me, looking at that picture, I can imagine the thoughts of what was going on in my mom's mind when she was putting all those documents together. Here we are. This is something that we're going to take to create a better opportunity for my children. And we say that, you know, we, well, how, how, you know, why that way? Well, my mother tried to apply to get a visa to come to the U.S. legally. But the system wasn't functioning that she got rejected. And like any loving, or loving mother would do, she took a chance. She, could she took the chance, one, to reunify her family and two, to risk everything, perhaps, that one day one of our children could become an attorney. And that whole experience from there on just takes me, it was just a surreal experience. Because the next moment I'm in the desert, it's dark, rocky, dusty all over, and I can see probing lights in the distance. 
And all of a sudden, I hear, vamonos. And we're running, we're running and running. And then my mother falls down, face down, as she was carrying my little brother. My brother, like, just falls off. And no time to say, are you okay? He, the coyote, picks him up. Those people who, who usher and help Mexicans or immigrants cross into the border to the U.S., picks him up, and we start running. And for me, just thinking that experience, at five years old, I wasn't afraid. I, wasn't, I didn't even know what was going on. But looking back, just what was going on in my mom's mind and heart. Anything could have happened that night. She could have been killed. She could have been raped. Her kids could have been kidnapped. And these are not theoretical dangers. These things happen every single day. Approximately 20, I mean 200 immigrants die each day crossing the border. Over 80% of women and little girls crossing from Central America, from Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, get raped. They actually, AP did an interview with one of those, uh, one of those little girls, and they asked her, well, aren't you afraid? And, you know, she responded, you know, for us, we're already mentally prepared to be raped. So when I see the debate on immigration, when I see the debate on the politics, it's very easy to come up with a false dichotomy. The good immigrants, the, you know, those ones who, are, who came as here as children, they have no fault. You know, they're, they're in school. You know, he's a lawyer. She's a doctor. They're the good immigrants. But that implies that there is bad immigrants then. It implies that, you know what, even though I didn't come through knowledge of what was going on, that my mom is at fault. But you know what, at 74 years old, my mother is my hero. My mother took everything and risk everything to give me a better life. And I will never blame her for giving me the opportunity to become and actually fulfill a dream that she had. Because if there is any memory that I have and hold very dear, is that day we were, when, that night when we were crossing the border, she was holding my, tent, my hand very tightly reminding me that she was there to protect me, no matter what. She was there that, to be on my side, no matter the danger. And her only aspiration was very simple. I want my kids, my family, to have a better opportunity than I did. Very instinctive of any loving mother. And since that day, you know, the only thing I can remember is being a typical Brooklyn kid. Going to Coney Island, eating Nathan's hot dogs, taking a bath with little sharks and bubble bath. Just a typical Brooklyn American kid. And for me, I consider myself an American. I consider myself a proud New Yorker. Sorry, Texas, but New York is number one. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that right here. But this is, this is the experience of learning to speak English, learning what our Constitution says, learning the government. And this is the experience of so many people that it's not so different from many of your experiences. But of course, you know, experiences vary. And it was not until high school that I started realizing that, you know what? I am not the same as my friends. 
I remember applying to uh, getting the applications ready to go to college. One of the one of the my goals was to go to the to West Point, the military academy, because I wanted to serve the country I call home. And I went to my counselor, Mr. Russo, and said, "Hey, you know, Mr. Russo, I, I'm here, ready. You know, I want to go here. I want to go here." And all what I got was simply, you know, sorry, Caesar, but. I don't think you can go to college. You are illegal. At 16, 15 years old, my world collapsed. I, be, I have been working in, in restaurants since I, was, since I was like about 14, as a waiter, as a busboy, because my, mo my mom always told me that we need to work hard. But at this, when I heard those words, I felt that that was it. That was, that is, that's what I was just going to be. And there's nothing wrong of being a waiter or a dishwasher or a busboy. But I wanted to make my mom proud. But, you know, I came home. And like any mother, to all the mothers, you know, she felt that there was something wrong when she saw me. And I told her, like, you know, mom, I don't think I'm going to, I'm going to be able to go to college. And she said something so deep, but very simple. Nothing you would read in Plato's Republic or in Aristotle's Ethics. She just said to me, Cesar, cuando una puerta se cierra, otra puerta se abre. When one door closes, another door opens. And that has been the defining philosophy of my life because what I learned with those words is that when life slams shut when life slams shut a door in your face it's not because life is telling you you can't do it you're not good enough or you're stuck life is actually telling you this is not for you keep looking for your path Keep looking for your open door. And I really, really took that to mean that I need to keep looking. And the other component that I really realized was that, that you're never alone. When I was applying to college, it was my friends who pulled me and said, hey, Cesar, you know what? Let's go to St. Francis College. Let's go to school here. Let's just go have fun. Let's go party, but you know, let's, let's study. And that was an incredible support system that I got. Was it easy? Absolutely not. Did I think I was not going to be able to make, make it in college? Like many of you all, college can be difficult, can be fun, but it can definitely be challenging. But it was also the, the times where you think that, for me, I was not going to be able to make it. And it wasn't because of my grades. It was because... One day, I got an email from the registrar's office. And for some reason, they had misspelled my name on my records. They misspelled it with C-E-S-A-R versus C-A-E-S-A-R. And I got an email saying, hey, Mr. Vargas, uh, we just need to verify you know, your correct information. Can you come back with your social security? I didn't have one. So I deleted that email. You know, I, I thought it would go away. And I got another email two weeks later saying, well, Mr. Vargas, you know, we need to really correct this, um, but the dean has called to meet with him. You know, for me, I was, I couldn't ignore that email anymore. I couldn't delete it anymore. And I remember going up the stairs all the way to the uh, top floor and opening up the door in with a big office and the dean with a stern face and said, Mr. Vargas, sit down. And there's two things that he told me that, you know, till now I you know, will never forget. One, Mr. Vargas, if you cannot produce a social security, then you're going to have to leave uh, school. You can't continue here. And the second part that really just was just the most frightening, he said, well, and not only that, but we're going to have to 
report this to immigration. My most immediate thought was just immigration agents coming into school, the college campus, and detaining me, and I would never see my mom or my family. But as I always say, there's people behind you having your back. And my actually academic advisor intervened, and I don't know what he said, and personally I didn't care. All I knew is that he told me that I could stay and just continue with my education. And that was a big ray of hope that I got because it meant that I can continue to pursue my education in philosophy. You know, I came into college trying to major in e-commerce. I had no idea what it was, and I graduated with a philosophy degree. What do you do with a philosophy degree? At that time, I didn't know, and what do you do with it? I really thought for some time that I wanted to be a philosopher walking around and just talking to people, questioning them, and just being annoyed. But, you know, looking where I am now, what am I doing? Talking to you all. And, and I started realizing that when I told my academic advisor about my story, I started to realize that my story was not a liability. It was, not, it was nothing to be ashamed of. Was I afraid? Absolutely. Was, were at times I was ashamed? Yeah, I didn't tell none of my friends. You know, one of my friends who, act, uh, who actually served, uh, became a Marine officer, you know, kept telling me, Cesar, let's go. You know, let's do this. And I, all I could say, no, nah, that's not for me. I don't want this. Now, later on. You know, without him really knowing that I was, I wanted to do it, but I couldn't. But I realized that our stories are very powerful. And I realized that there are people out there that are willing to have your back. And, you know, when I started seeing the doors open and me completing college, here it goes, life again, closing another door. What's next for me after college? I couldn't work, I couldn't use my degree, I couldn't get a job, so, but you know, the words of my mother always come to me when things get difficult. You know, she always says throughout, she has always told our family, en la familia tiene que ver un doctor o un abogado, and the family always need to have a doctor or a lawyer a doctor to take care of the family, and a lawyer to defend the family. And, you know, for me, I, I really took that to heart because it meant not only that I needed to know the law to understand my own legal issues and my own legal challenges, but also because we always need, I wanted to be that attorney that represents their community, that represents people who have no understanding of a, a system that's outdated, that's broken, and also to really protect the community against unscrupulous lawyers who take advantage of the immigrant community. And so there I am again, taking a chance, working two years, seven days a week in a restaurant to save up for law school. Was it easy? Absolutely not. I took the LSAT about three times. I failed it three times because one, I couldn't afford a course. And second, it's a damn hard exam. But I wanted to really push the boundaries of what I can be. And ultimately, I got rejection letters from law schools. Even though I had the actual score to make it into law school, and getting those responses. Sorry, Mr. Vargas, if you don't have a social security, you cannot go here, period. And no scholarships, no financial aid, but somebody told me to go to the City University of New York School of Law, and I approached the dean, and I told her, you know what, I wanna go here, but I, 
I, I won't be able because I don't have papers and I can't afford it. And I told her my story. And again, it demonstrated the power of our stories to show that people are willing to listen to the very, very foundation of our values. And fortunately, because of that, I was able to graduate law school with a full scholarship and an opportunity to become a lawyer. And in that experience, I learned two major important things. One, to publicly come out that I was undocumented, that I was unafraid, that I was stepping out of the shadows to demonstrate that, you know what? A nine-digit number or a, birth, or a birth certificate from the U.S. or a Social Security card was not going to define my life. It did not mean that I was less of an American than anyone else. And that we, have an imp we can have an impact to change the nation regardless of our immigration status. Because throughout that time, I got actively involved with other students to change policy, to tell our stories and demonstrate that we are American. Is it, was it a difficult topic? Absolutely. Did people disagree with us? Yes, they did. But I do believe the power of stories because not only have I seen it change minds and hearts, but I, can, I have seen highest levels of government <laughs> responding to those stories. And the second part really was that, you know, affirming that there are people out there to have your back. If it wasn't for the dean of my law school and the administrators, I would not have been a lawyer. I would not have gotten to the point where I am at this point. But what was next? Here I am graduating from law school, and the bittersweet moment again came, walking across the stage to pick up my law school diploma. Here I am, you know, a Brooklyn kid, graduated and now a law graduate. But I had no, I couldn't work. And for the first time, I didn't know whether I was actually going to be a lawyer. And, you know, when I was getting ready to apply to the, to, my, to the New York bar, there was a little section that says immigration status. For me, I didn't know what to put. And there were some people, understand, understandably so, they were encouraging me to say, Caesar, don't cause any trouble. Just be quiet. Don't put anything. Just maybe, maybe you'll quietly under the table sneak in and no one will question that and you can become an attorney. But I couldn't do that because I already had come out publicly. I already had stepped out of the shadows in 2010 and I was not going to go back into the shadows just so I could be an attorney. For me, I wanted to push the boundaries of the law. I wanted to make sure that New York State can confront this major legal issue. And I wanted the federal government to really test this legal issue, not just so we can have a case after my name, but because it actually questions the very understanding of what is that American dream, right? What this country is about. I had graduated law school. I had the moral character needed to be an attorney. I took the bar exam, one of the most difficult bar exams in the country. I had done everything that was required of me. And we had to challenge the law to ensure that it was not just me being an attorney, but to open the doors for everyone 
who, has done, who have done everything to become an attorney. Because isn't that what this country is about? That if you work hard, if you've done everything that's done by you, you can be an attorney. You can be a doctor, an engineer, an artist, a, a police officer, a, a marine officer. And we won. Together with an amazing group of attorneys, the New York State General, Attorney General, local elected officials, the community members, we won. And on February 3rd of 2016, in a gilded courtroom, I was standing right next to my mother with my hand up as the first undocumented attorney in the great state of New York. And for me, the most significant moment there wasn't what was next in my career. For me, it was about simply turning to my mother and telling her, Mom, your son is an attorney now. Because if there's anything that I learned from that experience was that the American dream is not about a fancy car or a big house or a nice six-figure salary. The American dream for me that I learned from my mother is that you have to do your part to open the doors of opportunity for everyone, regardless of immigration status, regardless of religion, sexual orientation, gender, you have to do your part. And I also realized that citizenship or not is not going to define me as an American. Because you know what? I still don't have the power to vote. I'm still not a U.S. citizen. But I have been able to participate in the political process that has given me a voice. I have been part of the, of the presidential campaign of Senator Bernie Sanders, helping him craft his immigration policy, his uh, health policy, and demonstrated that, you know what? You don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to be a citizen. You don't have to have millions of dollars and hire lobbyists to have an impact in this country. It took a small group of students to push President Obama to provide deportation relief to dreamers, to those who came here when they were little. We have demonstrated that regardless of our status, regardless of our backgrounds, we can have an impact that goes beyond the politics, that goes beyond the policies, but to our values. And I think this is where we are in in this point in time. It's about having that genuine discussion of what immigration reform is. What an immigrant is. And when, when I see the debate, when I hear the candidates, and now the new president, I'm just reminded one very simple fact, that we can clash, we can debate, but we can tell each other's stories and still share the same values. And I think that's really what matters. Because I think we all have that rich story that we can all tell. And actually, the next thing that I'm going to ask from you is, I'm going to ask you two questions. And you're going to ask those two questions to the person either to your right or to your left. And the two questions are, one, where are you from? And two, where are you from? The reason I say the second one is because usually, especially in the Southwest or in the Midwest, when you ask that question, people say, I'm white. No, I'm black. Oh, I'm just brown. No. In New York, it's something is very different because over there it's like, I'm Italian, I'm German, I'm Irish, I'm Pakistani, I'm Bangladesh, I'm Asian, Korean, you name it. But for, so apparent, for some reason, we forget that richness of our background. So we're going to ask those two questions. 
So, and we're going to have two minutes to ask that. And then we're going to come back so we can hear those stories that we all have. All right? So look to your right, to your left, and not to the people who you know each other. So two minutes, everyone. Any volunteers of stories that you heard, backgrounds that you heard that were exciting, interesting? Volunteers? See, you, 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 see that's a trick. When a professor or anyone's asked you, never look down, because that's how it is. <laughs> So my mom's side is Native American or Cherokee, and then my dad's side is German. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. How about that side? Yeah. You. <laughs> Black shirt. You, the one with the New York. <laughs> New York. I'm from Thailand. I'm from Thailand. How about this side? How about you? All right, well, you know, this is, we have these amazing stories. And we can have those debates on those issues that matter most to all of us. Whether it's the economy, immigration reform, health care. Let's have those discussions. Let's disagree. Let's put out our values out there. But let's never forget our stories. If there's anything that you learn from, from this discussion, it's something that I always hold dear. It's never forget where you come from. And remember the analogy about my mom, about the hand? We're all different, you know, different sizes, fingers. But you know what? Together, we can be a powerful force. And this great nation has extraordinary stories to tell. And we have seen this before. We have seen us have blamed the others. Whether it was Irish, Italians, German, Jews, Chinese, you name it. This is part of the fabric of the growth of a great nation. But I really do mean that when we have those discussions, let's have those discussions in a genuine way and listen to our stories. So everyone, we're gonna open up to, for questions, but it was an honor and thank you everyone for welcoming me, welcoming me into your campus and thank you everyone so much. <laughs> questions, comments? Even if, they're, even if they're, they are questions that you disagree with something, it's okay. Are they ever going to let you become a legal citizen? Well, that's, that's a, you know, that is the challenge, right? When people say, well, get, get in back of the line. That's get in crazy. line. There is no line. You know, as an attorney, trust me, I, I have investigated every little option that I could possibly think of. There isn't one. So absolutely, do I, do I hope for that day that I can you know, swear as a U.S. citizen and actually, and for me, yeah, to also serve in the armed forces? Absolutely. But till we get there, what I'm going to do is my part to ensure that we have a immigration system that reflects and that is smart rather than focusing on talking points. And I hope so. I hope that one day I can become a U.S. citizen. But you know what? A piece of paper is not going to define me whether I'm American or not. I am already am. I'm a proud New Yorker and someone who is already an American. Uh, by stepping out of the shadows, are you putting yourself at risk? And I'm sure you've been incidentally inspired other people to step out of the shadows. And so what is the risk for you now and other people? Who well, the reality is that I can still be subject to deportation anytime. Immigration agents can come and detain, incarcerate me, and deport me. The other thing is like I've gotten threats, including death threats. I actually just get an email saying, die illegal. 
my mother has gotten messages on Facebook saying, we're gonna find, we're gonna come to your house and gonna find your boy Caesar. So is the threat real? Is the, is the risk real? Absolutely. But you know what? I'm like, as I said, when I came out of the shadows, is to proclaim that I will not let fear defeat me. And I will not let fear define my view of what it means to be in this great nation. Well, you know, in terms of, you know, for example, uh, people who, in order to become a citizen, one of the components is, is to take a citizenship test. I mean, you're a pass. I mean, well, exactly, right? Like, like I've <laughs> taken it already like a hundred times. And, you know, like, for example, can anyone, can anyone respond to the question of if the, if the president is no longer able to serve and the vice president is no longer able to serve, Who's next in line? Speaker of the House. Huh? And who's next after that? Speaker of the Senate. Uh, or, no, 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 Senator or Secretary? Come on, this is a show about that now. The designated survivor. Secretary of Defense? It, it could be any secretary after that. Okay, that's a secretary though. But yeah, you know, it's like, it's this type of questions that, you know, really challenges for people to know your system of government. But yeah, you know, in terms of becoming a citizen, to the same question, there is this process that doesn't exist for many people. Many people want to become citizens, absolutely. But there is no. And you know, the other, the other, the other uh, part of this is that when people say, well, you know, we have 11 million undocumented immigrants here in the U.S. And the picture is automatically, well, you know, all those people crossing the border. But you know what, 50% of that undocumented population actually came here legally with a visa on a plane. So, you know, when we're having this discussion about immigration reform, let's put everything out there to see we can see the whole picture in order to come up with a proper, genuine debate of, you know, of opinions and actual solutions. Well, you know what, See, that, you know, I was actually uh, doing an interview with uh, NBC and they asked that question, well, you know, do you think uh, on the Trump presidency, is it, are you afraid, are you concerned? And I was like, you know what, I don't know. I, I'm not, one, I'm not afraid. Two, you never know what's going to happen. The reality is that under a Republican president, Donald, Ronald Reagan, immigra immigration reform passed. You know, we had had a Democrat presidency we didn't have anything obviously complicated politics but you know what a presidential election is much more different than governing and I can tell you that that we are gonna whether it was Donald Trump Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or anyone else as an American we have a job to hold them accountable to ensure that they govern on our interests and that is exactly what we should do and you know, will I disagree with, do I disagree with some of his policies? Absolutely. But at the same time, I know that I'm going to hold him accountable to ensure that he, the new president, can actually serve the interests of our families. Because you know what, like half of my family, mo actually most of my family, are already citizens. And, you know, that's the complexity of our immigration system. That It's not just, you, when you think about undocumented, it's not just one undocumented family and that's it. I have clients now who the parents are undocumented, but the son is a Marine, the daughter's a Marine, and the other uh, one is going to join the army. So you have three children serving their country, but they have to worry about not the enemy abroad, but they have to worry about their own government deporting their family. So. It's, it's definitely complex, but it's about listening to those stories that you really get to understand the solutions of any problem. I'm gonna ask a question, I wanna preface it by saying it's not a hostile question at all. But how did Columbus, Ohio, a state that was just carried by Trump and wanted to win, there's gonna be a game between the Mexican national team and the U.S. national team, a soccer game. Now I know if the game were here, there'd be a lot of Mexican flags in the mm -hmm. stadium. 
Could someone, let's say, who was part of Trump's base be upset by that? Well, and I think really at the fundamental of what it means to be an American, right? And for me, like, you know, look at my pin right now. I have a Mexican flag and an American flag. I'm sorry, I can't see. Oh, so I have this little pin, right? <laughs> and for me, I am proud. Like, I love Mexican food. I love the bread. I love hot Mexican hot chocolate. But also, I'm proud to be an American. And when people, you know, in, in New York, for example, you know, to really understand what that freedom is. Like, I see when, they t when in the World Cup, when Italians are playing against the Germans, all you see is German and French flags. And it's beautiful because despite them saying, you know what, I'm Italian, yes, go Italy. At the end of the day, it's about being an American and enjoying something of freedom that we can express that. You know, like I mentioned before, do I disagree with, you know, people's opinions and policies? Absolutely. For me, personally, I w I'm not a Democrat or I'm not a Republican because my loyalty lies to my community and to my country. And when it comes to this sports games, personally, you know, it's it, having a flag of any other country does not take away from you loving this country. And it may be, you know, there may be disagreement about that, right? But I think it's really understanding that, you know what? If you are proud to be Italian, go ahead. If you're proud to be German, great. If you're proud to be Ameri uh, Mexican, great. But, you know, it, it shouldn't take away to be an American. Just as, just as like the constitutional right to burn a flag, right? Is it, does it offend people? Of course it does. But you know what? That's the beauty for me, like as a student of the Constitution and the law, it's about those freedoms that we really hold that, uh, dearly. And, you know, I think that's, and it's, it's the, the debates and it's the, the differences that make that conversation about, you, all, you know what? You shouldn't have a Mexican flag. You, shouldn't, you should only have uh, an American flag. That's fine. Let's have those discussions. Um, but I think it's really bringing it down, bring it to the very fundamental level of why people want to do that. You know, for me, like, you know, I'm a New York fan. I don't like the Houston Texans. Sorry, guys. And I, I, don't sh I should not say those things while I'm in Houston, right? But, you know, I think it's, we can have, like, those differences um, and still truly call ourselves, you know, Americans. Comments, questions? Okay, we'll take one more. As a lawyer. What was I'm sorry? What type of cases do you work on as a lawyer? Well, mostly it's on immigration. And I have, you know, one of my, actually, you know, one of my other passions was criminal law. And just quickly to, on the, on the criminal law, one of my internships during law school was uh, in the Kings County District Attorney's Office. So when I was applying for this internship, you know, I submitted my application, and I got accepted. And there was a big debate whether or not I should take it. One, you know, some people were saying, no, don't take it, Caesar. It's a law enforcement agency. You know, they're going to check your fingerprints. They're going to check the FBI is going to check your background. Do you really want to put yourself out there? And then there was, you know, advice from people like, you know what, just do it, you know, just why not take a chance and ultimately I applied and I actually honestly spoke to the uh, the chief assistant district attorney and they told me and I told like listen I have no papers I have I'm undocumented I don't have a citizenship uh, I still you know can I still do the internship and you know it's a prestigious internship and you know she told me very straightforward you know what if you were applying for a job of course that would be an issue but we selected you based on your grades, on your academic performance, and on your passion to serve in the public interest and public service. That's it. And, you know, and for me, even the district attorney himself later on wrote a letter of support for my bar admission. Um, and I, so I guess to answer your question, you know, immigration and, and law is intersected in so many different ways. 
So even if I take an immigration law, it's going to connect to criminal law, to family law, you name it. Um, but it's really, you know, really understanding that you know, our immigration or any legal system is a reflection of our, our attitudes at, at the moment. And I really don't believe that we should let fear dictate you know, the greatest, you know, our greatest aspirations when it comes to what we want to see ourselves in the next 20, 30 years. Forget about the four years. You know, these four years are going to come and go. It's about the next 20 years. It's about you all when you all graduate, about graduating without debt, hopefully, being able to buy a home. And I do mean that. Like for me, it's not about just, oh, I just want to get citizenship and go on with my life. I want to make sure that I can do my part to ensure we all have an opportunity, whether you have citizenship or not. Uh, to do our part to make sure that we can make this nation a better place.